This week on Newsnight, a look at what the recent election might mean for conservation and development in Central Florida. Plus, several prominent Florida Republicans are expected to take up roles in the next Trump administration. Newsnight starts now. Hello, I'm Steve Mort. Welcome to Newsnight, where we take an in-depth look at the top stories and issues in Central Florida and how they shape our community. First tonight, the election of environmental advocates to the Orange County Commission and whether voters in the Orlando area are sending a signal on urban sprawl. Incumbent Nicole Wilson saw off a challenge in District 1 and Kelly Semrad beat an opponent who had the backing of Orlando Mayor Buddy Dyer in District 5. In District 3, meanwhile, incumbent Myra Uribe defeated a challenge from former state senator Linda Stewart. Alongside victories for conservation-minded candidates, two key charter amendments passed, establishing a rural boundary with greater hurdles for would-be developers and handing control of annexations of county land by cities to the county commission. Last week, I talked about it with UCF political scientist Aubrey Jewett. I think you could say that Orange County voters, the vast majority of them, want to protect rural land, are concerned about not just development, I mean, they're not against development per se, but about sprawling development, and they want to make sure that the county has sufficient regulations in place to make it difficult for developers to just go out and build or to maybe pl play the city off against the county, right, where the county feels like they don't have any authority. And so, yeah, I, I think the Orange County voters made it very clear that they're not against development overall, but that they want it to be smart development. They don't want it to be sprawling out into rural areas that they believe should be protected. The distance between Orange County and the Orlando metro area and the rest of the state politically does seem to be great at the moment. Yes. Yeah. I mean, basically, if you look at the map of Florida right now and color coded red and blue based on the election results, Florida is very red. And there are, you know, maybe a half dozen blue spots from the Democratic perspective. They'd be the blue oases, you know, in the red desert. But from a Republican perspective, they'd sort of be, you know, these are the apostates, you know, in these areas. But it's Tallahassee, Gainesville, Orlando and now Broward that still remain fairly blue and Orange County is one of them. Aubrey Jewett there from UCF. Well, let's bring in our panel now to break it all down. Joining me in the studio this week, Ryan Gillespie from the Orlando Sentinel, writes about local government for the Sentinel. Good to see you, Ryan. Appreciate Thanks it. Thanks for being here. Editor of the Winter Park Voice, Beth Casso, coming back to the program. Good to see you as usual, Beth. Yeah, good to be here. And Eric Orvieto, who writes uh, for the Oviedo Community News. Good to see you, Eric. You too. Before we start, we should note that Kelly Semrad is an employee at UCF, and WUCF is licensed to the University of Central Florida. Ryan, let me start with those charter amendments, including Amendment 9 on the rural boundary. If you could just first of all, and you've been covering this so much, just remind us what that amendment does, Amendment 9 specifically. Sure. So now in Orange County, there are pretty huge swaths of land, mostly on the east side of the county is, is a lot of it, generally east of, of like Lake Nona in the UCF area. Yeah. And then there's also some, some substantial but smaller properties out west where that are essentially are carved out from urban style development. You need, if you wanted to build something on these rural lands that you might see, you know, more in the suburbs or in the city, cities, um, you would need a super majority vote of the Board of County Commissioners, so a majority plus one vote. And then if you wanted to pull a property out of that boundary, presumably to develop it yeah. urban style, you would also need a super majority vote of the board. This rural boundary abuts Seminole County's rural boundary, right, where there already was one. Uh, voters had some choices to make as well on that boundary in the election. What did they come up with? Yeah, so the Seminole County rural boundary has been around for a couple of decades or more than a couple of decades now. And the voters had a chance to strengthen its protections and make it Again, a supermajority vote from the Board of County Commissioners of Seminole to uh, make any changes whatsoever to the lines or, in, or things inside the boundary. So voters overwhelmingly approved the two amendments, um, the charter amendments, by more than 82% uh, voting in favor. 82%. Um, in favor of it for each. And both 
officials, state or city and county officials, conservationists, all have said how important these charter amendments were to strengthen it for the future. I do want to get to how the public views these things uh, in a moment, but 82% is, is pretty resounding, isn't it? Amendment 10 also passed, all the charter amendments passed in, in Orange County, right? That gives the commission the power over approving annexations. I mean, how do you think this will change that relationship between county officials and developers? You know, might it impact things that, you know, that were envisaged, like that, that huge Deseret Ranches land development that's been talked of? Well, yes, and, and for example, with the Deseret Ranches, which the last time I was here we were talking about, that deal totally fell apart. There's now a new arrangement where um, a, whole, a whole bunch of things yes. were settled between city and county, and, and the, the city abandoned that annexation effort. But, but what I think Amendment 10 will do for the county is I think it gives them leverage over, over developers, because if you, if you talk to people on, on the county side of these things, what they say is you go into these meetings with some, with some developers, not all of them, and the county says, we want you to do X, Y, and Z with your development. And if the developer doesn't agree, the developer can come, or the landowner can come back with, okay, well, we're just going to annex into the, into the city of Orlando, or we're gonna annex into Apopka, or whatever city we're yes. dealing with. Um, and so that gave what you know, County Mayor Jerry Dimmings and some other people said, an outsized position for the developer over the county. So I, th I think that element changes here, especially when we talk about desert ranches where now they are forced to come back to the table with Orange County. Orange County can basically assert themselves more, but, but there's yeah. also a whole bunch of hurt feelings now on both sides of this between the county and city and the desert ranches crew and the county. So that relationship's got a lot of work to do between now and whenever the heck they just, they want to develop this thing. I mean, there had been a feeling, hadn't there, on, on the county side that maybe Orlando and the Mormon Church were trying to get something through before Amendment 10 went to the voters, right? No, that was explicitly said, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think everybody involved knew that, I mean, they scheduled a vote, presumably, to yeah. approve it the day before the election um, with with that clock in mind. But but this, you know, the settlement came forward something like a week ahead of that. Um, so it never ended up coming to be. What about the um, Orange County Commission results, Beth? You've, you've covered this pretty closely there at the Winter Park Voice, um, particularly that battle between Kelly Semrad and Steve Leary in, in District 5. That was a pretty contentious race there, right? And we've talked about that on the show, but, but remind us about what the, the issues were that were at play in that election. Well, a lot of it goes hand in hand with these charter amendments yeah. because one of the central issues in the race was development. District 5 happens to run from downtown Orlando through Winter Park out east into the rural area where that some of these amendments you know, specifically touched on. And uh, there was a huge effort to get more commissioners or to get more commissioners elected by the development yeah. community. They heavily funded not just Steve Leary's campaign, but we saw that play out in districts one and three as well. And I think it's, <clears throat> you know, when you talk about district five, you can't really do that without talking about those other two races too. Resoundingly, the voters in all of these districts where seats were up for reelection said no to development interests and to tourism interests. Those were the two heavy industry funders of uh, opponents in, in all three of those county commission races. It was interesting, wasn't it, that Steve Leary had the endorsement of the Orlando mayor, Buddy Dyer, as well, right? What did uh, the, the Orlando mayor have to say about that race? Do we know why he backed him? You know, officially, the campaigns released statements that said Buddy Dyer backed Steve Leary because uh, Steve Leary had been the mayor of Winter Park. They had worked together. They had a relationship. Uh, but if you look at who funded the campaign, you not only had Dyer putting in money from his own pack into that race, you also had um, people who were trying to get development passed out east, people who were yeah. suing the county over develop previous development decisions that directly affected the city of Orlando because the yeah. city of Orlando was trying to annex some of these lands. So, um, so you know, you can draw your own conclusions uh, 
looking at some of the money there. Well, I'm going to put this question to, to all of you about what you think the support for the amendments and for these environmental advocates indicates about voters' priorities when it comes to development and conservation. It seems like, as we discussed, that this is mirrored in Seminole County, right? There seem to be very similar sentiments. Most definitely. The battle between conservation and de conservation land development is is one that's ongoing in Seminole throughout the state throughout Orange and I've written a lot about it when we did the corridor yeah. pieces um, is the oldest story in all of Florida exactly yeah. Yeah. and and the, the, the reason that it's so important is even in areas that are not within the rural boundary itself that might butt up against it or be relatively close to it um, it's not just for conservation and, and land it's practical reasons as well. Sure. Any development into annexed into potentially annexed areas in the rural boundary in Seminole will lead to issues with traffic, uh, yeah. huge traffic increases, huge pollution increases, um, stormwater uh, drainage issues. Real impact on real people's lives. Real infrastructure impact yeah. to people's lives on a daily basis that would be noticeable immediately, not to mention the cost of building out utilities into these areas that don't have utilities there and the cost that it would it would be for the municipalities themselves to that it would be the burden on there so any potential you know some of the arguments from developers is oh it can bring in tax money more property tax money yeah. but that would be offset pretty pretty quickly from the ne the necessity to build in such new infrastructure into these areas that just don't have it in there um, from water, electric, everything. Yeah, and I, I think that's why those issues, and, and I think that's a really key point, it's not just about environmentalism, it's also about you know, voters sitting in the mm -hmm. core of Winter Park or downtown Orlando saying, hey, wait a second, what's in this for me? If if land is developed out here, that puts pressure on my schools, my roads, yeah. and police and fire too. So you're talking about a huge taxpayer investment to make those developments really work. And, and you look at the flooding over the last few years, you know, from Hurricane Ian on, yeah. on since in city in municipalities like Winter Springs, and if mm -hmm. there's particularly hard in, hit, which was that. super hard hit and yeah. had so many infrastructure problems um, that that led to that and. If there's stormwater coming in and stormwater reten uh, retention issues from the rural boundary where they're using that land to really collect a lot of that stormwater, the flooding, the amount of flooding, extra flooding would be just catastrophic. I guess these are common issues in areas that are growing really fast, urban areas that are growing fast. Well, I mean, what do you think, Ryan? What do you think this says about the sensibilities of, you know, when it comes to Central Florida voters? Well, I think. We talk a lot when we, in politics and whatnot about how divisive things are now and yeah. how everything is so partisan. This is kind of one of those bipartisan issues because, you know, these amendments were passing at such a margin that this is Republicans and Democrats. And to bring in a totally unrelated uh, topic but similar, um, if you remember a couple of months ago, out of the state, we had plans to develop state parks. That yes. was bipartisan pushback. There were Republican members of Congress pushing back at the Republican state government alongside a lot of Democrats who were outraged by that. So I think with environment and development, that kind of meld, you've got a pretty good bipartisan coalition that we've seen play out here. And, and on that, in my reporting for on, on environment, on environmental issues in the corridor and within the rural boundary, Repu both Republican and um, Democratic and nonpartisan um, officials all said, this isn't a partisan issue. The, uh, the environment protection in Florida specifically is, does cross party lines. It's so vital to so many things that it, it's a, it doesn't matter whether one area is red or blue. It, it's really about the, all of these other issues around it. I mean, the environment in Florida has sort of been nonpartisan for a while and in a practical sense. We also see this out west, right, with water issues, particularly mm -hmm. in places like Arizona, it's become um, a bipartisan issue. I mean, I'm interested though, um, because the area is still growing, there's no doubt about that, about how um, that pressure between the desire of voters to keep things in check and the, the pressure on our local leaders to allow development. I wonder how you see that playing out. What are those, what is the balance that, that lawmakers are having to uh, to come up with now? So I think if you look specifically at, at these Board of County Commission can candidates, yeah. I think it's it's easy to think of like, oh, there's pro-development and then there's another side. I, I don't think the, the winning candidates would say they're anti-development. Yeah. What, what they have said is they've taken this, what they call smart growth mindset of 
just because we're growing doesn't mean we have to grow everywhere. We can grow very dense in, in urban areas. So if you think of downtown Orlando, Brownfield and sites, yeah, yeah mm -hmm. we, can, we can keep building up and we can infill and do all of these things to add more people to population centers and also protect the environment in places where it's natural lands out east. There are challenges with that. You know, if you, if you look at the projections of the hundreds of thousands of people that were expected to add to this region in the next couple of decades, you know, if we were to put them all in current urban areas, we don't have like a transit system right now to support that, for instance. So that's something that needs to be figured out. The infrastructure that we have is really old. It's 100 years old in some sense, underground yeah. with the stormwater pipes. Those are things that we need to figure out. Um, those are certainly going to be the challenges ahead when you look at some of the 20, 30, 40, and 50 projections on population. The thing I hear consistently from, from people, from officials, is you, we have to build up, not out. And that's yeah. the, so important. And then you get into the issues with housing and affordability and, and all that. What does that look like? Is it, is it more, if it's building up, is it luxury apartments, which then put prices people out? So it's such a giant issue. In Florida, no doubt. A reminder, you can find my full interview with Aubrey Jewett breaking down the outcome of the election in Florida on our website, wcf.org slash newsnet. Okay, finally tonight, it was a mantra from some DeSantis supporters during the Florida governor's presidential run that he would make America Florida. Well, it turns out Donald Trump is doing a bit of that himself. While Florida's U.S. Senator Rick Scott failed in his bid to take over the GOP leadership role in the Senate this week, there will be significant roles for Floridians in the incoming Trump administration. Among them, Florida Congressman Matt Gates, who Trump nominated this week to be Attorney General, and Trump's soon-to-be Chief of Staff Susie Wiles, a Florida political operative and Trump campaign co-manager who also led Governor DeSantis' successful 2018 gubernatorial campaign. She'll be the first woman to ever hold the White House Chief of Staff job. In addition to Gates and Wiles, Florida's U.S. Senator Marco Rubio is nominated as America's top diplomat, bringing his Senate experience to the U.S. Secretary of State role. Rubio is now seen as loyal to President-elect Trump, but amid the incoming administration's America First agenda, political watchers point to the Florida senator's often hawkish views on foreign affairs. I think that what life will be like on this planet for the next generation will be determined very much by what we do or fail to do here over the next two to three years, and certainly with the issues that are before us today. Al-Qaeda has established eight new training camps in Afghanistan. Meanwhile, Volusia County Congressman Mike Waltz, a former Green Beret, has been tapped by Trump to be his national security advisor. Waltz has taken tough stances on China and cautiousness over future USA to Ukraine. He's been a staunch critic of the Biden administration, including on the chaotic U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan, which he talked about on Newsnight. It was a mistake, uh, and I've been consistent on that across multiple administrations. Uh, what we can't do is fall into the false choice that I think is currently being presented by the Biden administration, that it was complete withdrawal, go to zero, or you know Switzerland-style nation building or a D-Day-style invasion of hundreds of thousands of troops. Uh, what I've long called for, uh, and, and, and with the Trump administration and Biden, uh, was a small force of special forces, intelligence, uh, our, our drone uh, capability, but importantly, that supportive capability to the Afghan military. Uh, and what we just saw is that we withdrew all at once their air support, intelligence support, uh, maintenance support, uh, and um, uh, logistics support. And you know, we really pulled the rug out from under them at the height of the fighting season, and they needed that. Congressman Mike Waltz there from uh, Volusia County. Okay, Ryan, let me start with you on this one. Marco Rubio is in line with the for, the for the Secretary of State role. Uh, the governor will need to appoint someone to fill that vacant seat now. Who is being discussed in, in the reporting that you've read, and, and, and how significant a choice could that be for the governor, do you think? It could be a very significant choice, especially depending on what, which way you go. I don't think this is a likely outcome, but there's nothing stopping him from appointing himself to the U.S. Senate or appointing his wife. I, I haven't seen a lot of reporting that, that touts that as a realistic possibility, but he could do something like that. Um, there's been talk of his chief of staff, a man named James Uthmeyer, as, yeah. as a potential candidate, former House Speaker uh, Jose Oliva, um, and, and really all kinds of other Republicans. Laura Trump. Mix. Laura Trump, uh, also another one. Um, all of this is sort of held up because the governor's been in Italy for the past week as like the entire leadership of Florida outside of him has been shaken up. So um, I don't know 
how serious the conversations have been at this point, but uh, I'm assuming once the governor gets back stateside that that's going to be uh, top of list. The Rubio and Waltz picks are, are interesting, aren't there? Uh, Mike Waltz for, for National Security Advisor. They're on a very sort of similar kind of hawkish page, if you like, when it comes to U.S. foes, I guess, like China and Iran, Venezuela and so on, international terrorism. I mean, do you think um, the pick of these two Florida Republicans says something about how the incoming administration might sort of tackle foreign affairs. I mean, these are not isolationists. Yeah, I, I don't know if if yeah. anyone can really say what the the focus will be because everything is in such up in it's so up in the air. You know, Rubio and Waltz, like you said, have been traditionally hawkish, although they've recently kind of stepped back from that. Um, Waltz making comments about Ukraine, or his, his stance on Ukraine changing and focusing more on China. Rubio, who's been hawkish against China, Iran, Cuba, Venezuela, ha has started talking more about you know, falling in line with the peace through strength and um, lines that, that, tr that the Trump campaign ran on. So I don't know. It, it's, yeah. it's, a, it's really up in the air to see kind of which way it goes of how they're going to focus from those two those two positions. I mean, there are, are a lot of unknowns, right? But in sharp contrast um, to those sort of what we might see as more traditional picks, we have Panhandle Congressman Matt Gates, uh, who's been picked for the for the uh, Attorney General role. He's a sort of a firebrand, a MAGA loyalist, if, if you like. Um, it's been interesting, hasn't it, to, to see how his nomination has been received by not only Democrats, but also his fellow Republicans. Yeah, the it, it has been really surprising because a lot of the GOP senators and, and Congress people have started coming out either questioning it or flat out against it. I know Lisa Murkowski came out and said she was shocked, and Susan Collins it was surprised by it. And there's a lot of a, a lot of people kind of up in the air where they haven't had that same response to other cabinet picks to to what they did with the Gates. Um, and. So that will be interesting to see how that plays out, if he will even be confirmed because of those questions up in the air. Those of us here know that he spent quite a lot of time in Central Florida. Some of his best friends live here. Very locally relevant. One of those best friends is, is now in federal prison, but for a long time they were seen around town together. You're referring to Joel Greenberg. To Joel Greenberg. And so uh, he is familiar to people and, and definitely a controversial pick. Um, of course, on top of the announcement that he is Trump's pick came Matt Gaetz's announcement that he's actually resigning from his seat. That and, raised a lot of eyebrows, yeah. Right. And just days before, my understanding was there was going to be a vote on whether to release a report related to the ethics investigation that's been underway. So I think there's a lot of question marks in terms of what's going to happen there. Um, I think because of the local connection to the Greenberg scandal, uh, the Matt Gates uh, nomination has gotten a, a lot of local buzz. I did want to talk a little bit about uh, the president-elect's choice for his chief of staff, uh, Susie Wiles. And those of us who have been around a while would have come across her. She and Governor DeSantis have, I think it's fair to say, a fairly strained relationship. Uh, remind us how that relationship has evolved over time. Right, so Susie Wiles, another huge Florida connection to what's playing out nationally. Yeah. She's known as um, the person who has steered the Trump campaign for, I believe, a couple elections now, and also had steered Ron DeSantis' uh, initial campaigns and was very close to the governor, was my understanding. There was a falling out between these two, mm. which, is, which is interesting. Um, that's going back a few years now. And, you know, under normal circumstances, let's say 20 years ago, people would probably still remember that there were, was, were a number of stories about how the governor uh, during his earlier term was um, potentially selling golf outings. I mean, to put it simply, there, some of the, the fundraising was taking place in this way. And some of the documents were leaked. Um, and uh, the reporting shows that the governor blames Susie Wiles for these leaks. I believe she said, no, wasn't me. But regardless, they are um, no longer as tight as they once were. 
it does add an interesting dynamic to what's already a fascinating relationship between the governor and the, the incoming president. Yeah, the, the, the two of them, their relationship has been very tumult, up and down. Yeah. Um, it, it's had its highs and lows, and you know, during the primary season, Donald Trump was calling Ron, Ron DeSantis, Ron DeSanctimonious, and, but it seems since they've met and they've, they have a connection, I don't think you'll see, be seeing Oval Office visits necessarily um, from the governor, but I don't think there's going to be anything policy-wise that'll be negative toward Florida, especially since Donald Trump calls Florida home now. And um, I don't think there's any support. Even Susie Wiles, you know, people around her have reportedly said that you know she's a pro. She's not going to take anything out on DeSantis or, or the state. So I don't think that's anything to worry about. And to kind of bring that this conversation full circle, I, I think you will see um, you will get a commentary maybe on the relationship between the governor and the president with uh, Governor DeSantis's appointment to fill the Marco Rubio Senate yes. seat. Um, there's been a lot of talk out of Trump circles that I've seen reported that, that they're pushing Laura Trump, mm -hmm. understandably, very he heavily. Um, we'll see if the governor goes with that or if uh, maybe somebody closer to him. So many fascinating things to watch, and I know you guys will be doing that for sure. We'll talk much more about these issues in the coming weeks as President-elect Trump firms up his plans for the next administration. Meanwhile, be sure to join this conversation on social media. We're at WCF-TV on Facebook uh, and Instagram. We're also on X as well at Newsnight WUCF. But that is all the time we have for this week. My thanks to Ryan Gillespie, Beth Cassav, Eric Corpietto. Thank you guys so much for coming in. Really appreciate Thank your time you. today. We'll see you next Friday night at 8.30 here on WCF. From all of us here at Newsnight, take care and have a great week.